World leaders are in Bali for the G20 summit. They have a lot on their agenda, including the global food and energy crisis and the war in Ukraine. But are they likely to find a unified solution? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahalbarra. The G20 summit is underway on the Indonesian island of Bali. Leaders from around the world are hoping to get a consensus on a wide range of issues affecting billions of people. And the post-pandemic global economy is top of their agenda. But tensions about Russia's war in Ukraine have taken center stage with the majority of members strongly condemning the military action Russia's foreign ministry says the summit is not a place to discuss security issues and the world's economic challenges should be prioritised. So will there be a unified action? We'll bring in our guests in a moment. First, this report from our diplomatic editor, James Bace, who is at the summit in Bali. G20 summits take place every single year, but this is a most unusual one given the circumstances of the war in Ukraine. And it's been most difficult for the organisers in Indonesia. In fact, many months ago, I remember speaking to an Indonesian diplomat who was worrying about exactly how they were going to choreograph this summit. And that's because one of the members of the G20 is Russia, the country that invaded uh, Ukraine. One of the things they normally have at a summit like this is known as the family photo, when all the leaders smile for the cameras. Well, that's been abandoned at this particular meeting because there's no family feeling here and no one felt like a photo. Uh, we certainly uh, don't have all of the normal participants here. That's because President Putin decided not to attend the G20 and to send in his place Sergei Lavrov, his foreign minister. But he is cutting his visit here to the G20 short and not attending the last day of the summit. President Zelensky of Ukraine was invited by Indonesia to be a guest participant. He too has decided not to come to this summit because he says he has to be at home uh, at a time when his country is under attack and he hasn't left Ukraine since the start of the war. But he did address the G20 by video link, making his point uh, that his country does not want to do another peace deal with Russia until Russia's pulled all of its forces out of Ukraine. This is James Bayes in Bali for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests in Bali, Denise Rudich, director of the G20 Research Group in London. She is also a global governance expert and also advised several countries with anti-corruption policies. In Washington, Daniel Speckhardt, president and CEO of Koros International and a former U.S. ambassador to Belarus. In Moscow, Sergei Markov, director of the Institute of Political Studies and former Russian member of parliament. Welcome to the program. Denise, the G20 summit has always been a forum about financial stability and other pressing global issues. This time it's really quite different in different aspects, particularly the fact that Russia is there and Russia its invasion of Ukraine is dividing many countries within the G20. Yes, so the G20 is the premier global forum um, to discuss issues of economic uh, concerns and economic stability. Um, it was kind of born out of an economic crisis. Um, the first G20 uh, finance ministers and central bank governors meetings was in 1999. Uh, however, in 2008 was the first time that the leaders came together uh, from the world's largest economies um, to discuss issues of common concern. So the G20 makes up of about 85% of global GDP. 75% of world exports are uh, generated by G20 countries and, you know, the, and they make up two thirds of the world's population. So um, that said, it has, uh, sometimes there are specifically on the sidelines, there are 
uh, bilateral meetings or, or trilateral meetings, et cetera. And then there do tend to be um, some kind of uh, side, side statements that tend to be issued or that may have been issued condemning mm -hmm. uh, different countries or, or addressing some of the geopolitical issues of the day. Daniel, since 1999, the, uh, the rationale has been basically if you bring together the greatest eco economies of the world, uh, unified when it comes to dealing with global issues, you would send a very positive signal to the uh, entire world. But when you have countries in this particular summit pushing for isolating Russia and you have others in the same camp saying, no, we have to have Russia on board, could this be the biggest crisis facing G20? No, I don't think so. I mean, this is uh, part of international uh, affairs and diplomacy. Uh, these things go up and down. Uh, the G20 has a strong uh, reason for existence in this context of getting these other voices to tables that there aren't a place for, right? We need voices like Indonesia and Brazil and Saudi Arabia and Turkey and Australia at these tables. So it's really important that this continues. At the same time, when international events like this are happening that are capturing uh, really a global attention uh, for good reason, right? We have a nuclear power here uh, that has uh, said that they haven't taken off the issue of using nuclear weapons. That's going to draw a lot of international attention on the security side, and it sometimes overwhelms these economic issues. But I don't think we have to worry about the future of the G20. Okay, Sergey, I mean, the, the Russian foreign minister, Sergey Lavrov, I said this is not a place to discuss some of the security issues, particularly I think he was referring to the war in uh, Ukraine. What is, what, is, what is Russia's biggest concern when it comes to this summit in particular? Because you get the sense that the Russians are really concerned about the final communique. Uh, no, Russia has no concern. Uh, Russia has been concerned about uh, some possible terrorist attack against President Vladimir Putin. Uh, because we know that uh, now it could be uh, very much realistic and we know that uh, United States and British intelligence service, they uh, use a terrorist attack. For example, they terrorist attack against uh, gas pipeline and nuclear terrorism, which is conducted by a key repressive regime against the Parosia atomic power station during uh, three months. And you know, uh, this information campaign of demonization of Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. in all Western control media uh, uh, globally. And it was concern, it was the main reason why Vladimir Putin uh, decided not to go to this uh, uh, G20 um, uh, summit. As about uh, resolution, we were absolutely sure that uh, uh, now G20 is divided uh, on the West and non-West. And uh, the number of non-Western countries just bigger than Western countries. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why uh, we were sure that there was no bad uh, negative words uh, about uh, Russia in this resolution. Finally, the compromise was uh, that uh, now it's some sentence that some of the countries um, accused Russia and some of the countries have alternative position over this issue. Denise, it's, uh, normal. We have no uh, so much big concern about this. But okay, the I... split between West and non-West is the main result of this 20, uh, G20 summit. Okay, Denise, China and Brazil in particular opposed to any steps to be taken against Russia. China's stance when it comes to the war in Ukraine has been widely seen as a sign of the eroding relations between the United States of America and China. What are the expectations as far as the summit are concerned against the backdrop of this political divide? So uh, yesterday, um, President Biden and, and President Xi Jinping had a three-hour bilateral. So this is the first time that mm -hmm. the U.S. and China have met in five years. And what was, uh, I will say, extraordinary was the tone of the meeting. It was incredibly conciliatory. The language used was... Um, it was positive. It, it looked like they were creating bridges. Um, they created a mechanism whereby, uh, you know, before an issue escalated into a crisis, um, they were going to make sure that the, the individuals with the right level of seniority, or they've indicated uh, that they will make sure that the individuals with the right level of seniority are involved um, before there is another crisis. In terms of whether, uh, you know, uh, there will be a, a 
a final communique um, or whether there will be agreement on, on every single, particularly geopolitical issues there, you know, definitely might be challenging. Uh, what Indonesia has done, which is fantastic, is uh, created a theme whereby they, you know, the, the, the summit theme for this year is um, it's all about unity. It's about coming together. Mm -hmm. It's about making sure that we all recover stronger together. Uh, they picked, you know, kind of overarching topics that are, are of interest to every single country at the summit. Um, global health infrastructure and our global health architecture, mm -hmm. um, digital transformation, uh, just energy transition and sustainable energy transition. So these are all things that that the countries, regardless of, you know, whether you're, you're east, west, um, uh, and at what particular uh, level of economic development you are, we can all, you know, we would hope that we can all agree with uh, to find common ground for, for the common good. Okay, Daniel, can you help us navigate through the very complex landscape of the G20? Because this is a summit that was supposed to tackle those issues that we spoke about, which is basically the post-COVID-19 uh, economic uh, order, the war in, the, uh, in Ukraine. But then you have this, the, the bilateral meetings, Biden met with, uh, Chinese uh, Xi Jinping amid growing U.S. concern about China, China's growing global clout. Two, two separate things here. Uh, which one is the top priority for the United States of America? War in Ukraine or China's growing role? Well, you know, I think uh, a country like the United States is going to have to have multiple top priorities, and China certainly is an equal priority to the issues going on in Eurasia. At the same time, when you start talking about insecurity related to nuclear, potential nuclear weapons, as I mentioned earlier, that grabs your immediate attention. But I like what Denise was saying here. Right? These G20 meetings are more than just the communique. They're more than just what the collective is talking about. They are about these bilaterals. They are about a lot of uh, opportunities for world leaders to get outside their countries and to talk to other world leaders and to get a different perspective. And that's why, again, the G20 brings more of these uh, leaders to the table, allows them to see the world in a different perspective. So for me, what's really important uh, about this uh, uh, summit is these meetings between the Chinese and the Americans, which haven't happened in a long time, also between Australia and China, the opportunity to have these discussions in a bilateral context. And then these leaders go back to their countries where they're overwhelmed by their domestic issues and politics and economics, but they come back with a worldview. And while they may not be able to tackle all those issues, Denise said, in a way that brings consensus, makes us all feel warm and fuzzy, I can say that these meetings usually have an important impact on turning eyes towards international affairs in a way that is powerful uh, over time. Sergey, in the past, such meetings were an opportunity for uh, R Russian leaders to showcase their growing geopolitical influence. But they seem to be more and more isolated. You said earlier Russia is not really concerned. But when you see that each time there is a gathering, you feel like that the Russian officials are struggling to try to press ahead with their own narrative, particularly when it comes to the war in Ukraine. Of course, uh, now Russian uh, diplomacy in the very uh, difficult situation. We see the huge attacking of the US-led uh, uh, coalition against Russia in all international organization. Even, you know, Russian sportsmen not allowed to go to the um, Olympic Games. Uh, so, of course, Russian diplomacy in uh, uh, big trouble. Uh, but it's exactly the time for the good diplomats. Uh, Real, uh, real, how real is strong Sergei Lavrov, but we could see uh, if he is uh, acting in a very difficult situation. The uh, Russian uh, goals, uh, goals of Russian diplomacy is absolutely clear. First of all, we want to explain to everybody that it's not war between Russia and UK. Ukraine is war of the United States of America and personally Joe Biden against Russia using their uh, uh, proxy Ukrainian army. Secondly, we want uh, uh, to show that Russia is ready to the uh, peaceful compromise in any moment uh, if Russian interests uh, will be respected. And specifically, Ukraine will be neutral, democratic. All thousands of political prisoners, prisoners in Ukraine will be liberated. Russian uh, language, which is language of the 70 percent 
of the population of Ukraine uh, will uh, get official status and all terrorist groups, uh, including neo-Nazi groups, should be prohibited. If this uh, will be this respected demands Russia, uh, easy to the, uh, can easily go to the uh, peaceful uh, negotiation. Another important uh, goal for Russian diplomacy is a uh, uh, new direction for Russian economy mm -hmm. uh, because Russia imported a lot of uh, goods from the uh, European Union countries now because sanction is impossible. Russia needs to build much more uh, intensive economic relations with non-Western countries. And Lavrov did it. Okay. Denis, do you think this could be a moment when all the parties are trying to look and see whether what is happening in the Ukraine, the Chinese-American rivalry, could somehow create new political realignments within the G20? Could we see a consolidated Russian-Chinese-Brazilian axis as opposed to the axis led by the United States of America? Oh, wow, that's, a, <laughs> that's a one very interesting question. I think um, one of the big challenges is here, uh, you know, there were recent elections. So in, from a kind of political will, high level political will, that's that's definitely going to be missing. Um, I think the rhetoric that has been used, uh, it, you know, again, or the, the rhetoric that began to be used uh, when the war in Ukraine happened, um, you know, the, the use of words like allies and, and, and alliance of states and and whatnot um, by the U.S., you know, we are we are in a times of war. So uh, I I I I say don't expect um, for the G20 to mm -hmm. to end the war without the key players at the at the table. You you know for for that you need international diplomacy. You need everybody around the table um, that has the ability to make the decisions. We don't have mm -hmm. uh, we have one of, out of out of the three country or well we've got two out of the, the three countries or well the four countries. Let me try it again. We have two out of the four countries um, that you mentioned that need to be brought brought to the table at the very least. And that's definitely going to be a challenge. However, there are a number of issues that are of concern to all of those countries. Um, international trade, food security, mm -hmm. climate change. Um, these are things that are, uh, you know, rising inflationary pressures, volatile markets, uh, not just in traditional finance, but also in, in new finance in the crypto industry. I mean, these are all things that are affecting the population and, and the, the daily lives of, of individuals who live in, in those countries. So, again, if they can come to agreement on at least those issues, um, I think we're definitely, you know, 50 steps forward. Uh, will the G20 end the war in Ukraine? I um I am a little bit skeptical about that because, like I said, we don't have okay. the right place around the table. Daniel, when, uh, 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 the reason why I'm asking you uh, uh, about China and the United States of America, because you look at the, at the platform itself, the forum, the G20, now the two leaders of the US and China met. When you look at the relations between the two, under Trump, there were tariffs imposed against China. And then in 2022, the Chips and Science Act was imposed against China under the Biden administration, which basically encourages advanced technology to uh, manufacturing to move back to the United States of America. On the other hand, the, Russia, the Chinese seem to be really preoccupied by where they considered as a aggressive push by the Americans when it comes to Taiwan. Is this something that could create more problems for the G20 in the future? Or this is something separate, bilateral, between just the US and China? Uh, well, I think these bilateral issues often bleed over into the multilateral forum. So don't be surprised if it comes up again, and it's always kind of there as a little nettle. But I do think these, again, offer an opportunity for international leaders to come together where they don't have to set up a specific bilateral meeting with all the pressures that come from a bilateral meeting in terms of being able to produce results. This gives, especially in these kind of uh, opportunities to kind of soften back into a dip diplomatic way to engage uh, through dialogue, leaders an opportunity to tiptoe back into these relationships. And I see that's what's happening here. I see it's a very positive move for both China and the United States. And of course, if China and the United States get along, it's a positive move for the world, uh, economically and politically and from a security perspective. So mm -hmm. I think uh, everybody watching this should be pleased with 
the positive messages that are coming out, while at the same time not being, you know, uh, uh, naive that this relationship is just going to turn into something very warm, right? Okay. Is this uh, China has a view of its future, and the United States is a global power, and they're going to continue to compete probably on the world stage. Sergey, uh, right after the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, the supply disruption globally, along with the rising inflation, the uh, the soaring energy prices have been widely seen as being weaponized in a way or another by Russia to further get some political gains. Uh, is Russia in a very delicate position as we speak? Because there is a massive pressure on the Russians to, at least when it comes to the export of grains, to show that it is willing to make sure that there is a smooth supply of grains globally. Uh, of course, situation quite difficult uh, uh, about the grain. Uh, it's uh, now a big uh, struggle. Uh, of course, uh, that uh, uh, agricultural crisis uh, also partly connected with uh, uh, blockage of the uh, Ukrainian and Russian grain to the uh, international market. But uh, mm -hmm. same time. Uh, the amount of, of uh, Russian grain uh, to the market uh, three or probably five times more than the number of uh, Ukrainian grain. Mm -hmm. And uh, also uh, Russian grain is uh, those uh, who is uh, uh, used by humans uh, in the um, different countries. But uh, Ukrainian grain mostly go to the uh, uh, animals uh, in Europe. And uh, so uh, there was some uh, pressure from the, all the uh, countries to Russia, and Russia agreed to deblocate Odessa and Nikolai port for the Ukrainian grain. Okay. But it was part of the grain deal, and Russian grain uh, should go to the uh, international market as well. It's uh, profitable for Russia. But Western countries, as you may know, uh, they uh, violated almost all agreement. It's uh, that why we have a diplomatic crisis uh, uh, globally. All right. And uh, Russia insisting that uh, Western countries should follow their promises and uh, to stop blockage of the uh, uh, Russian grain access to the global Let, market. Let's move forward because I have a few other angles to cover with you, uh, if you don't mind. Denis, uh, shortly, if you don't mind. This is a moment when the world is looking forward to reopen borders, lift COVID-related restrictions when you have the G20, which represents something like 80% of the GDP struggling, divided. Do you have any, is there any optimism in the air that we're likely to see some string of economic decisions to be made to make the world a better place to live in? I, I sure hope so. Um, particularly, we're looking at uh, some, some decisions that are going to be made around uh, global taxation reform. I think we're going to be looking at uh, more funding being put forward for just uh, the Just Energy Transition Partnership, um, looking at new forms of financing, including sustainable uh, models and, and new partnerships that are being elevated. Um, and I definitely we're looking forward to, or at least I'm personally looking forward to, um, some some work being done mm -hmm. around the space of anti-corruption and uh, beneficial ownership transparency, which I know doesn't sound that impactful, but given that uh, corruption mm -hmm. accounts for three trillion dollars, um, it could have massive impact, and then that, that okay. funding could be um, used for something else. Daniel, authoritarianism, which is on the rise, climate change, poverty, uh, lending to those who are distressed economically, seem to be now on the back burner, given the fact that there is this massive focus on the war in Ukraine and the rivalry between the United States of America and China. Are we likely to th see those issues just relegated to the back burner for years and years to come? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't think this uh, is going to stay at this level of uh, attention uh, forever. So you're going to see uh, uh, some sorts of progress in Ukraine one way or the other on the diplomatic or, or military front. And that is going to find some room again for the economic issues, the environmental issues and other issues to take their place. The reality is Ukraine actually is very impactful on the global economy on food uh, to many other countries, creating a food crisis in terms of uh, both the quantities as well as the pricings for many of these countries and your listeners. So the reality is Ukraine does need to get addressed. And actually, if Ukraine gets addressed, you're going to see improvement in the economic issues and allow us to actually turn back mm -hmm. to environmental issues, which are affecting so many countries.
I really appreciate your insight. Looking forward to talking to you in the near future about this story and many other topics. Denise Reddish, Daniel Speckard, Sergei Makrov, thank you very much. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com, for further discussion. Go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story from Miha Shemahbara and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.